Hello, welcome to week 13 of Computer Science 225. This week we're talking about the Vim text editor again. We talked about this in an earlier week, week three or so of the class. Um, but in week three, we only really covered the things that Vim does that pretty much any other text editor will do as well. So in week three, we looked at how we can use Vim to open up a file, uh, edit the file, save the file, quit out of it. We talked about Vim's mode system, which is important to understand so that you can actually like write text in, in addition to use the command mode. We talked about how to do copy and cut and replace, undo and redo, uh, search and replace, save, stuff like that, sort of the basics things that, again, any text editor will be able to do. But this week, we'll start to talk about some of the things that makes Vim unique, that makes it more powerful than most other text editors. The things we'll do in this week are things that the text editors that come in most IDEs just aren't able to do. They don't have the features to do these things, at least not directly, not as easily. Uh, other text editors like Sublime Text or Visual Studio Code or other things like that also don't have the things that we'll talk about today. So in particular, we'll look at how Vim commands are sort of built up. Uh, we've looked at commands like how you, exam for example, cut a line, like uh, delete it and also sort of make a copy of it. But Vim actually allows you to cut not just a single line with a command, but we can also cut things like just the single word that we're in. We can cut from where we are to the end of the line. We can cut the block of code that we're in. We can cut the from here up to a given character. We can cut within the method that we're in. We can cut within sort of the while loop that we're in, but not the entire method. It gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of how you can actually like apply your cut action. And all of this is just done with keyboard shortcuts, so no having to like drag the mouse around and stuff. And it turns out that these are relatively straightforward to learn because it sort of works using this sort of language system where you can combine up an action with what you want to apply the action to, which we'll talk about in good detail. Um, but it's pretty cool once you get the hang of it. We'll also talk about counts, where you can sort of apply one shortcut multiple times. We'll talk about Vim's register system. So in most text editors, if you copy something, and then you copy something else later, the thing that you copied the first time is gone. You, it, doesn't, it doesn't save it around anywhere. But Vim actually has what it calls registers, which allow you to have multiple things copied all at the same time, and then you can paste from any of them, as opposed to just having sort of one copy location. We'll talk about marks, which allow you to uh, sort of make bookmarks in different files. So let's go ahead and open up a terminal like usual, and we'll start talking about how we can do some of these things. OK, so let me go into somewhere where I have some code. I have this library.java um, text file that has some Java code in it, so we can start talking about some of these things. All right, so like I said at the start of this video, we are going to look at how Vim's basic commands for doing things like cutting and copying and deleting text can be done not just on a single line, but in sort of any sort of range that we want. So we saw last time how if you're on a line of text and you do the dd command, it will delete that line of text. It will cut it, essentially. It will delete it and also make a copy of it. But the sort of cool thing about Vim is that its commands can be built sort of using this language system. So in English, just as sort of an aside, we form sentences using different parts of speech, right? We do things like verb followed by an object, like a direct object. So for example, I can say like, I throw the ball. And there, I throw is the verb, and ball is the direct object. That's the thing that's being thrown. Or I can say, he drinks water. And then drinks is the verb, and water is the direct object. Vim commands sort of work in a similar system to this, where they have sort of a syntax to them. So the in this instance, the verb that we do is D for delete. D is the verb. That's the action we're telling Vim to do. And then after that, we give it a direct object, essentially. We give it what we want it to delete. If you say the name of the verb twice, so delete, delete, DD, that says just do it on the current line. 
but we can give it another thing, a different thing after the D to say delete something else. For example, if I do D followed by any of the movement commands that we looked at last time, then it says delete from here up until where we get from this movement. So if I say DW, that will delete just a single word. It will cut just the single word public in this case because that's where my cursor was. So W as an action, uh, as a command just by itself, it says move on to the next word. So we can sort of loop through word by word like this. And if I'm on the start of a word and I say DW, that says delete from here into the end of the word. So that's sort of forming a sentence command in, a, in essence. We say D, that's the verb, delete, and then we say where do we want to delete to? DW says delete to the next, to, to, to the end of the word that we're on. So we can do DW, 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 DW to delete sort of word by word as we're going through a file. And now the cool thing about this is that this allows us every time we learn a new verb, we can apply it to multiple different sort of like places like this. So for example, we also looked at the Y command, which does yank, which is what Vim calls copy. And so if I say yank, yank, again, that applies to just the current line. And you can see that's what I've copied. But if we say YW, that says yank word. And so now you've seen that I've copied just the word public here. If I'm on the word library and I say YW, I've yanked the word library instead. So every time we learn a verb, we can apply it now to just the current word by adding a W after the name of the verb command, essentially. So this works for any motion. If I'm on this line of code here and I say DJ, J means go down a line, this will delete the line I'm on and also the line below it. So it should delete the books and the customer's line when I say DJ. Likewise, if I say DK, it will delete this line and the one above it. Uh, we looked at the movements, I think, little g, little g to go to the top of the file, and capital G, which goes to the end of the file. So if I'm at any point in the file and I do D capital G, it'll delete from here through the rest of the file. And if I'm on a line and I say DGG, it deletes through the, bot uh, through the top of the file, like that. So all of these actions can be combined up with any of the movements that we've seen. Other movements we've seen are caret, which goes to the start of the line, and dollar, which goes to the end of the line. So if I want to yank from, let's say, here to the end of the line, I can say y dollar, and that will copy that parameter list like that. Or I can be here and I can say d caret, which will delete from where I was, up through the end of the line. I guess it doesn't include the, the character we're on, so that will delete from there to the start of the line. So let's look at some more of these verbs, some more of these actions that we can apply. So far we have D, so DD will delete a line, and YY uh, yanks a line, so we've seen essentially what you probably know as cut and copy. There are other ones too. One that's really helpful when you're dealing with code is the equal sign verb, which is for fixing indentation. So if I do equals equals, it will fix the current line's indentation, indenting it where it should be relative to the lines around it. And this works well with Java code uh, because in Java you can tell what the indentation is supposed to be from the curly braces. It doesn't work as well in Python because in Python you don't necessarily know what the indentation was supposed to be. If it gets messed up, you sort of have to logically figure out what it's supposed to be. Whereas in Java, it can be just sort of this mechanical process. So we can use this equal sign action. And so if I want to uh, equal sign to re-indent, from here through the bottom of the file, I can do equals capital G, and that indents the entire rest of the file, fixing any indentation that got messed up. If I mess up just a few lines on every method here, um, you'll see that this will work. And if I go GG to go to the top of the file, and then equals capital G, it re-indents the entire file, and now everything should be fixed. And that's a helpful one for dealing with Java code if your indentation gets messed up for any reason. Another thing that's cool about these commands is that, like I said, you can apply them to different sort of ranges. And we're going to look at more sort of ranges as we go on in this video today. Uh, but another thing we can do is we can apply them to any selection. So if we have just sort of one method that's messed up, one way that we can do this and fix it 
is by selecting it by going into visual mode. Remember, visual mode you go into by doing the V key. Select whatever text you want, and then any verb you apply, it is implied that it's going to apply it to just this visual selection. So if I hit D now, it will go away. It will delete it. You can also do the GV key that reselects the most recently selected selection, which is one I use a lot. If we do Y, it'll copy it. You can see it says seven lines yanked. And if we do equal sign, it re-indents it, which is really cool. Another of these actions that we can apply is the less than and greater than actions. What these do is the less than sign, if you look at it, it looks like a little arrow pointing to the left, and that says unindent this code. Whereas the greater than sign looks like an arrow pointing to the right, and it says re-indent or increase the indentation for this code. So if I do this selection and I type the less than key, it moves it to the left, one as you can see. And if I type GV, oops, I have to um, reselect that part, and I type the greater than sign, then it moves it out. And I can do that as many times as I want, and it moves it out and out and out. Um, so that's a helpful one if you need to adjust the indentation. Equal sign does it automatically based off the braces. Less than unindents and greater than increases the indentation for it. OK, so those are the verbs we have so far. There are actually a few others um, that we can. I'm sure there's ones that I don't even know. But uh, those are the most useful ones for programming. D for cut, Y for yank equals for increase the indentation, or, or rather fix the indentation, less than for decrease the indentation, and greater than for increase indentation. I lied, actually. We'll learn one more. We'll learn one more, which is the C verb, which stands for change. Change is very much related to D for cut. Uh, but what C does is, because it says change, it actually puts you in insert mode so that you can change something. So if I was wanting to change this word public to private, let's say I want to make this constructor private for some reason, I can either do DW, go into insert mode, and then type private. Or what I can do is I can do CW for change word, and then put it as private like that. If you we're paying attention when I do CW, it not only cuts the word, but it also puts me into insert mode so I can say private like that. There's a few reasons for change existing. It, as I think you'll agree, that it doesn't really save us that much work just typing the I key to go into insert mode. But there are a few reasons. One is that it keeps it as sort of one action in my undo redo history, which is maybe kind of nice. But the other even bigger reason will come up later in this video when we look at using the dot command. So for now, though, just remember that C means change. If I select some lines of text and I say C, it will put me into insert mode so that I can start typing something else. Um, if I do CC on a line, it will delete the line and also put me into insert mode so that I can start writing something else. So now that we've learned a bunch of these verbs, a bunch of these actions, let's look at a few more ways that we can apply them. We've already seen a few. We've seen that if you just um, do the same verb name again, so dd or cc or equals equals or whatever, or less than less than, greater than greater than, it does it just on the current line. We've also seen now the word one, so we can do dw to delete a word. We've seen to the beginning of the file, which is little g, little g or to the end of the file, which is capital G. There's a few other ones that we can look at. One that I use rather a lot is the curly brace ones. So if we do closing curly brace, it moves us down some. <laughs> and if we do the opening curly brace, it moves us up some. And the way that it decides how far up or down to go is based off the line breaks. So I'll call it these paragraphs. We have these paragraphs of code that are essentially separated by empty lines. And so I tend to write each method ideally without any line breaks in it. Um, this works if you have short methods generally that fit on the screen at one time. And so all of these methods are just uh, contiguous sections of code that have no line breaks. And so the opening curly brace movement moves us up from one 
blank line to the next blank line. If we're not on a blank line, it just goes up to the next blank line. And so if you write your code like this, where sort of your sections of code are separated by empty lines, then it allows you to skip up and down between essentially the methods in this case, um, or to the section of code, which uh, is sort of our class declaration and our private variables. And the import section sort of counts as one too. So this way, with this movement, we can do any of these actions that we've seen on a whole method at once, or a whole block of code a whole section separated by blank lines. So if I want to delete this method, probably the easiest way is to say D and then closing curly brace. That deletes this constructor here. And I can delete this method with another one and another one and another one. This is helpful for like rearranging methods. So if I want, for example, this load customers method to be before the load books method, you can see I have some long lines in here which are wrapping around. I probably should separate those out. I can do D close curly brace to cut this one, come up here, and then paste it back above. And so now load customers is before load books. So you don't need to sort of like drag and select the mouse to select a method or anything like that. You can do it like this. Another way, if you sort of want to be sure and have some sort of guide as to what you're doing, you can go into visual mode and then do curly brace down so that you can see that the method is selected before applying the D action to it. But either way, this motion of the opening and closing curly braces is super helpful. When I'm writing text in Vim, not code, but just like, uh, you know, a, a paper or a recommendation letter or anything really, uh, I will put blank lines between the paragraphs and that way I can use this to rearrange paragraphs in the text I'm working on as well, using this sort of um, opening brace and curly brace commands. Another movement that we have in Vim is the percent sign. So if I was to use the percent sign, what it does is it brings you to the matching thing. So here, the cursor's on line 36. If I go to this curly brace and do percent, the cursor jumps up to line 19 because it goes to the matching curly brace. So it's kind of hard to see because Vim highlights the matching curly brace anyway. But if you look at the color changes each time I do the percent key because I'm going from one curly brace to the next. This works also in parentheses. You can jump from one parenthesis to the matching one with the percent key. This is sometimes helpful if you get like lost in your code if you're writing long methods and you say, oh, hey, what does this curly brace go to? If you hit the percent key, you'll jump up to the thing that matches it, which is helpful. But also, we can use it with any of our verbs. So if I want to delete the body of this loop, I can go to the curly brace here and I can say D percent and that will delete from where I was to the matching percent sign down below. If I want it to re-indent this try block, like if the code just in the try block is screwed up at, in different ways, um, if I'm down on the end curly brace of, I guess it's this one on the try block, I can say equal sign percent, which should re-indent automatically everything inside of the um, curly braces of the try block like this. So if I did it on this top one, if I say equal to the percent, it re-indents everything inside of there automatically. Okay, another set of these movements that we can combine up with our verbs, our actions, is the F and T actions. So the first of them is F. So if I am here on this word string and I do F equal sign, it will jump me to the next equal sign that appears on the current line. So if I do D F equal sign, that says delete from here up until the next equal sign that appears on the line. If there's multiple, it'll just do the first one. So let's see uh, a line that has multiple things. I guess here we have multiple sets of parentheses. If I say D F open paren, it will delete up from and include up from and including the uh, next parenthesis, closing uh, rather opening parenthesis that appears. So you, if I go into visual mode, you can sort of see this. If I do V F parenthesis, it selects from here up into the next parenthesis that exists. Um, that uh, can be used to sort of delete from like the current position up to whatever character we want to. So if I want to delete from like, let's say from here up to and including the less than sign, I can do D F less than sign. So that again can combine with any of the actions we have so far. If I don't have any on that line, so if I do like F 
less than or f equals on this line, there isn't any of those symbols, and so just nothing, there's no movement that happens. And if I do df equals or df less than, that also does nothing. It has no effect. That searches forward in the line. So if I'm like, uh, let's say here, and I do fi, it jumps to the next i character that appears on that line. If I want to go the other way and go to the previous i character, I would do capital fi. So little f jumps you forward to the next character, and capital F jumps you previous to the most recent of those characters. So here I can, for example, do d capital F less than to say go back and erase to the less than sign. Similar to the F character, there's also T. And T is very similar, except it goes up to, but not including the symbol that we give it. So if I'm here on string name and I say df equal sign, it deletes up to and including the equal sign. Whereas if I say dt equal sign, it goes up to, but not quite including the equal sign. I find that I use this one more um, for whatever reason. Like if I'm here and I say I want to change from here to the equal sign to put in a new thing here, C, T, equal sign. And I think of it as T standing for two, like delete to the equal sign, or change to the equal sign, or whatever it is. I can say go into insert mode, and then go to the equal sign, rather go into visual mode. So the T and the F are sort of similar, but F includes the character in question, whereas T doesn't. It goes up to, but stops just before that character. This also has a capital version as well. So if I'm here and I say capital T or lowercase t parenthesis, it jumps up to the next parenthesis, but again, stopping just before it. Whereas if I say capital T open parenthesis, it brings me back to the previous parenthesis, but again, just before I get there. So those are the F and T movements, all of which can be combined up with D or C or Y to cut, copy, or change those, uh, those areas too. All right, the thing we'll talk about next is text objects. So, so far we've seen that you can combine up these actions like delete, cut, or rather I guess it'd be delete, uh, yank, change, uh, indent with equals, increase or decrease indentation, things like that. We can do all of those paired up with any movement and then it says do it from here up into where we get with this movement. But there's another one that we can combine up with this. We can combine any of our verb action sort of commands with what Vim calls text objects. And those are ways of referring to different parts of the file based off of where the, con the cursor is at. So the first one we'll look at is very useful for Java programming, and it's I curly brace. So if I were to be in this, let's say this while loop body here, anywhere inside of it, and I want to change all of the code that's inside of this while loop. Well, one way I could do that would be to go up to the first line of it, maybe go into insert mode, select all of it, and then do C for change. Or if we want to do what we've learned so far in this video, we could go to the curly brace that begins it, and I could say C percent, and that says change from here up to where we get with this movement key, and percent says go to the matching curly brace, so that would do it. But if I wanted to do it a dif different way, I could use the text object I curly brace, which means anywhere inside this curly brace. So no matter where the cursor is inside of here, if I do C I curly brace, it will change all of the code that is inside of these curly braces. Likewise, I can do, of course, what, uh, let's do this one, let's say, decrease the indentation in this curly brace. And then it automatically will apply that action to all of the code inside of this set of curly braces. Now, the curly brace you can use is either one, either the opening clo or closing curly brace. The nice thing about this is it doesn't really matter where your cursor is exactly. You can just say, if I'm inside the loop anywhere, then I can say di curly brace to delete all the code inside of there. It does the next most um, matched <laughs> uh, set of curly braces that we're in. So if I'm in this while loop, it does the entirety of the while loop, including the for loop that's inside of it, but not including like the try block that we're in. Of course, if I was in just the for block itself and I did di curly brace, it would delete just the for loop. So it does sort of the most closely matched ones that we're in. If I'm up here, then, and I'm not inside of this method at all, and I do di curly brace, it would do the entire Java class because that's the sort of next set of curly braces that we're in. 
So that is a helpful one if you are inside of any of these sort of block structures that Java and other similar languages are based on and you want to replace the code with it, CI curly brace is an easy way to do that. And I'm realizing now that there's one setting I have for Vim that is making it not as optimal as it could be. There's a setting C indent, which is for C and C style languages like Java, PHP, C and C++, obviously anything that uses these curly braces to denote scope. With that on, it will do the indentation a little bit smarter for this type of language. And so now if I'm in an if block and I say CI curly brace, it should put the cursor sort of lined up where it's going to be for me to start typing the new method here. So I curly brace is, uh, means inside these curly braces. We have ones for the other sort of block structure characters as well. So there's also one for parentheses. So if I want to delete everything that's inside of these parentheses, I could do di paren. And likewise, we can use either the left or right paren, it doesn't matter. If I want to uh, just copy it, I of course could do y in parentheses to copy everything that's inside of there, and then we can see that's what's been copied. With this one, and also with the curly brace one as well, we don't necessarily need to be inside of parentheses for this to work. Right now, I'm not inside of any parentheses at all. I'm inside of curly braces because I'm in a method which is in a class, but I'm not inside parentheses. And so if I say ci paren, it'll jump to the next set of parentheses in the file and put me inside of those instead, even if it has to go several lines. So if I'm up here and say ci paren, it'll jump me to just the next parentheses that exist, which is helpful and, and cool. Uh, there's also one for quotes. So if I'm here, whether I'm in the quotation mark or not inside the quotation mark, if I see, say CI quotation mark, it will replace the code that's inside of these quotation marks and let me type something new. So that is a uh, set of three text objects, inside curly brace, inside parentheses, and also inside quotation mark that are really helpful for Java programming. They have related ones, which are, instead of using an I, we would use an A. So if I'm, let's start with the quotation one. So if I'm here and I say CI quotation, that I stands for inside or inner. It says replace inside of these quotation marks. It leaves the quotation marks, but gets rid of everything inside of it. Likewise, if I say yank in quotation marks, it yanks the thing that's in quotation marks, but it doesn't yank the quotation marks themselves. If I want the quotation marks themselves to be included, I would say a quotation mark, which stands for around. So if I say change around the quotation marks, it deletes the quotation marks uh, themselves in addition to the things inside of it. So if I was going to use like a file name instead, I wouldn't want the quotation marks to be there. I would say um, change around the quotation marks that so they themselves would go away as well. That also applies to the other ones as well. If I say delete inside these curly braces, it leaves the braces. Whereas if I say delete around the curly braces, the curly braces themselves will go away as well. And same with parentheses. If I'm right here and I say delete inside parentheses, they are left. Whereas if I say delete around the parentheses, they, the parentheses themselves go away as well. So I find these are really natural to use once you get used to sort of coding this way. If I'm in a method and I say like, oh, I don't, I don't want, I want a different if condition here. It's uh, not only more efficient, but I also feel like I, it, it makes sense in my brain to say, I want to change inside these parentheses. So I do C, I, parentheses. And now I'm able to start typing in a new if condition here. So the text objects are really helpful. They're, those are the most useful ones, I think, for coding. There are other ones, though, that we can use. One of them is inside word or around word. So we've already seen we can delete a whole word by being at the start of the word and typing DW. That deletes one word. But if we're in the middle of the word, it only deletes to the end. So if I say DW here, it will delete Omer, but it'll leave the cust. If I want to delete a word without needing to like worry about where in the word I am, I can do either DIW to delete inside this word. That one leaves a space after the word. Like the other ones, there's an around version. If I say DAW, then it deletes the word and also the space after it. It also, DAW sounds like it stands for delete a word, which uh, it doesn't quite, it says delete around word. But um, it's, it's a helpful way of remembering. If you want to just delete any word in Vim, you can say DAW as a command. 
Of course, all of these uh, apply not just to the delete or change action, but any of the ones that we've learned. There's a couple other ones. Um, I have another file I put in here. I have sample.txt where I just put some TX, uh, I just put some uh, text that I copied from the Vim Wikipedia page, actually, so we can show off some of the other ones that we can do. I use Vim not just for coding, but also writing regular text as well. And so one of them is the inner sentence and around sentence text objects. So if I want to rearrange sentences, like let's say I want to take this sentence that I'm in right now, and I want to move it to the end of this paragraph. Well, in a regular text editor like Word or something, you'd have to like drag your mouse to the beginning, make sure you get it right on there, and drag it to the end, and then do Control X, and then move it to where you want. In Vim, you can say DAS for delete a sentence or delete around sentence. Go to where you want it to be, and then paste it in. Oops, I should do this paste. And it gets pasted in where you want it to. So Vim is able to recognize sentences based off of where the periods are. If we do the v command that says visually select this text object so i can say like visually select around this um, uh, sentence and then you can see that it's good at detecting sentences based off of where the punctuation is at there's another one ip and ap for inside the paragraph after, around the paragraph so if i do vip you can see that it selects this paragraph that i'm in no matter where in it i'm at and if I say VAP, it does the same thing, except it also includes the line after it at the end. Uh, at the end, so this is also really helpful if you're editing something and you want to rearrange paragraphs. You can say DAP to delete the paragraph, and then P to paste it somewhere else. It's much uh, very convenient to not uh, need to use the mouse to do that to just use the keyboard shortcuts always. While we're on this, I'll tell you about one other action that Vim has, which is helpful for doing text writing in Vim as opposed to coding, which is to sort of automatically format text. So if you have text like this that's sort of jagged, Vim will allow you to format it in sort of a block structure using the GQ command. So if we do GQ AP, it says reformat automatically this paragraph. GQ around this paragraph, and then GQ around this paragraph. And it sort of structure it so that the sentences go as long as they can up until getting to the boundary um, of how long a line can be, which by default I think is 80 characters. Uh, and then it stops there. So um, that's another one, the GQ, if you, if you find that useful. All right, but let's go back to oops, regular code for now so that we can talk about a couple of other Vim features. The, that was the big one to me. That's the main reason that we just talked about that I really like using Vim is because I don't have to think about the text that I'm writing as individual characters, which is how most text editors treat text. It's like Word, as fancy as it is, it's just a sequence of characters and you interact with them as characters. You use your mouse or your arrow keys to go around between different characters. and it's not so much that Vim is more efficient that I like it, it's that it lets me treat the text in sort of like a higher level, more abstract way. I don't deal with this while loop as a sequence of characters. I deal with it as these different text objects. I can say um, di parentheses to change the conditions of the loop, and I can say di curly brace to delete the body of the loop. It lets you sort of interact with the text in a more abstract way that I find really appealing. But uh, there's other things we'll talk about in this video too. All right, so the next thing we'll talk about is counts, which can be used in Vim to sort of um, uh, say that we're supposed to do a command or a movement a certain number of times. So we've seen that we can say dd to delete a line. Well, we can also say 2dd to delete two lines, or 10dd to delete 10 lines, or 1000dd to delete 1000 lines. And of course, it'll stop because we get to the end of the file. So we can say how many times we want to apply a given action. We can also do this with the movement keys that we have, some of them. So the W will move to the next word. But if I say like 10W, it'll move 10 words forward. I can say 100W to go 100 words forward, and then I come down here. 
Likewise, I can do 5j to jump five lines down, 5j at a time. So these counts can be applied to different things, um, which, which is, can be helpful. They can also apply to our text objects, which can be used if you want to. I find that I don't do this so much, but it's, it's a cool thing you can do. Um, you can apply the counts to the text objects as well. So if I say delete inside these curly braces here, it does the if statement. But I can also say to delete inside curly brace, and that will delete the curly brace I'm in, and then also the one inside of that as well, so that we can make these sort of more complicated things. So that's the count system. Um, it basically lets you just prepend a number to a movement or a number to a command. Oftentimes people will use it with DD, so like we do 5DD to delete five lines at a time and stuff like that. All right, so next we'll talk about Vim's register system. And this is one of those things that isn't always that useful, but when it is useful, it's really, really handy to be able to do. So basically the thing is that when you are copying and pasting in any program, you are saving text somewhere. And in most text editors, when you copy, you save it in the only location, the copy buffer, copy paste buffer, I guess you'd call it. And there's only one of those. So if you copy something and then you copy something else, the first thing you've copied is now gone. In Vim, this is sort of by default the way it works, but we can also specify one of multiple registers that we want to copy into. So if I do YY on this line to copy the comment, and then I do YY on this line to copy the class line, when I paste, of course, it's the most recent thing that got copied, like it is for every other text editor. But there's something else I can do wherein I copy a line of text into a different register. The registers are uh, named after just single characters. And so if I want to, I can copy into a specific register. The way that's done is by prepending the command with the quotation mark followed by the name of the register you want to copy in. So what I often do is I use just named letters for registers. So if I want to copy this line and keep it somewhere, where it won't get overwritten by other things I copy, I can do like quote A YY to yank this line of code into register A. The default register is just unnamed. It doesn't, it doesn't have any sort of name, but I can have a named register like A, B, C, pretty much any letter. Now, if I copy other things, I can, can copy this line and this line, this line with YY, that has now overwritten or would have overwritten the default unnamed register. So if I just do P to paste, it'll be the class library line. But I still have this comment saved in register A. And so to bring it back, I can do quote A P to paste from register A. So again, that's not like the most groundbreaking thing that Vim does, but it is really nice. Sometimes if I sort of want to save a method, I can uh, select it in visual mode, and then I can, let's say we put this one into register C for constructor, because it's a constructor, I can do C, C, D to delete it. And now it's safe there, and I can make other changes. A lot of the things you do, like if I want to delete this blank line here, I would do D, D. That overwrites my copy-paste buffer, and so if I do paste again, it's just the blank line I deleted. But now this constructor is safe, so if I want to bring it back, I can do quote C, P to paste it back from register C. So again, not the most groundbreaking feature, but um, it's one that comes in handy and one that I don't think most other text editors have at all. All right, the next thing we'll talk about is marks in Vim. Marks are sort of bookmarks that you can put in files. And so if I have a method that I'm working on, let's say this save customer method, I can make a mark for it. Marks also are named with single letters. So I can make this as, say, mark S, because it's the safe method. So I'll type MS. Then no matter where I am in this file, I can go back to this location by doing single quote S, and that will jump me back to that same line. The default way of jumping is just by a line. So if I mark this, well, this line is already marked. If I uh, go back. Um, up like up here and I do quote S, it brings me back just to sort of the start of the line. If I make the mark in a specific column on that line with, again, I'll do mark S to mark this line, um, I can go back with 
uh, instead of single quote s, which just brings me to the same line, I can do backtick s, which brings me back to the same column within that line. So if that matters to you, then you can use backtick followed by the name of the mark to jump back to that mark. Or if you just care about going to the line, you can do single quote s, or rather single quote followed by the name of the mark to get you back just to the same line that the mark was on. One thing that's really nice is that these marks persist even if you save and quit. So if I quit out of this file and come back to it, I'm just at the top of it, I can do, again, uh, backtick S, and it'll jump me back to that same point in the file. So you can sort of keep your bookmarks for where you are working on things as you're going. These also work as motions, and so if I want it to delete everything from the start of the file up into the line where I made that uh, mark, I can do like D, single quote, S, and that says delete everything up to and including that mark. Um, so if I, if I want it to delete everything but not including the, the first line of this method, I can mark this line with like, I'll just do A, so MA to mark this line, go to the top of the file, and then delete everything to mark A, and it will delete all the way up to that point in the file. So again, you can combine any of these motions up with any of the verbs. All right, another topic we have is more ways to enter insert mode. So Vim, we said that we can get into insert mode by typing the I key, which it is. You can get into insert mode that way, but it's actually not the only way to get into insert mode. Another way to get into insert mode is with capital I. And with capital I, what it does is it combines up a motion with also putting you into insert mode. So I just leaves you where you are, the cursor where it is, and puts you into insert mode. But capital I brings you back to the start of the line and puts you into insert mode. And with A, it puts us into insert mode, but moves the cursor one to the right. So append, it says like, append after this current character, start typing something else. There's also capital A, which says append to the end of this line. So if I go capital A, it will put me to the end of the line and then put me into insert mode. This might not seem super helpful um, yet. It might seem sort of, uh, you know, trivial. But uh, when we get to the next topic and the last topic for this video, which is the dot command, this will actually uh, come in handy. Other ones, there's O. Little o puts us in a new line under this and lets us start typing. And again, if we had set C and dent, spell it right, C and dent on and I did a little O, then it brings me uh, lined up with where the next line of code should be. There's also capital O, which puts a new line above us and lets us start typing. So if I was wanting to like put a comment onto this line of code, you could go up and then into insert mode and then tab over and then hit down and then start typing the comment. Or what I would probably more naturally do is just do capital O. Capital O says put a new line above this and put us into insert mode so that we can start typing right away. A small savings, but um, the O ones I use quite a lot. And the last one is S for substitute, which deletes the current character and puts us into insert mode. So if I was to do it on this R, it would delete the R and then put us into insert mode again, which uh, is perhaps not that useful. Let's say if you want it to declare a second array list on this line, you could do S on the semicolon, turn it into a comma, and then start typing um, another name of an array list if you were making multiple declarations. Um, so those uh, key codes to let you get into insert mode with different keys, I and A and O and things like that, those are most often helpful with the dot command. So let's uh, look at the dot command first. What the dot command does is it just says repeat again whatever was the last command that we gave to Vim. This feature um, is super, super helpful. It might not seem like it at first, but what it lets you do is it lets you do the same command over and over again. So if I type DAW to delete a word, then I don't have to do DAW again to keep doing this. I can just hit dot and then it will delete word by word through the file as we're going. It repeats the previous command, which in this case is to delete one word over and over and over again. So that is what it does when you do it with the DAW command. If we do it with DD, then every time I hit dot, it deletes a single line. It just, again, does whatever was the last most recent command that you've done. Some places this comes really in handy is, let's say we want to comment out all of these lines of code inside of the while loop. Well, one way I can do that is I can go into insert mode and then navigate to where I want to be 
and then type the comments manually like this, line by line by line, which is kind of tedious to do. Another way that I can do it is to say, okay, wherever I am on the line, type the I, capital I, to go to the start of the line and into insert mode, and then put in the comment, and then go back to the command mode. So just do it for one of them. And because I did the I, that part of the command says go to the start of the line. And so then I can go down and I can hit the dot command. And that does the same command again. And the previous command that I gave it was go to the start of the line and put in the two slashes and the space. So now I can just repeat this over and over and over again, and it will comment, the whole, comment out the whole section. I can also do this for the append. One thing that I will sometimes do is if we're making a list of things, like let's say we're making an enum, um, which we wouldn't do just in the middle of a file like this, but why not? Um, and let's say you copy some colors from somewhere. We have red, blue, green, orange, or something like this. Well, the first thing we can do, I guess, is give it a name. Um, then we can fix the indentation for this. And then we can also do the dot command to add something to the end of the line. So if we need to add commas, we can do capital A for append a comma, and then just go down and apply that to all the other lines with going down and using the dot command again and again. So re being able to repeat the pass command ends up being really useful. Another place this really comes in handy is if we're doing something where we need to rename variables. So let's look at this variable name called values here. And let's say we want to rename this to be something else. Of course, we could do the substitution command that we looked at back in week three. But another way that I sort of end up doing this is you can search for it. So that brings you, it's in several methods, but that's OK. The next command will let you uh, cycle through them doing n little n to go forwards or capital N to go backwards, remember. One thing I can do is I can replace this word with the CW command. CW says change a word. So I'll say CW, and then I'll give this another name, like parts, let's say. Then instead of having to go and change all of them manually, I can do N to go to the next one, and then dot, which repeats my last command. My last command was to change this word to parts. And so this will let me just do it sort of all in one, one go. And then I can come down here. And if I want to, this is a separate method, but if I want to do this one too, I can do it pretty quickly just by cycling between n and dot. n brings me to the next one, and dot repeats the command. Again, our most recently done command was to change the word to say parts instead. So the dot command can end up being super useful. I also use this one in regular text. So if we come back to the sample text, I told you last time about the GQ command, wherein it will sort of reformat things for you. So if I have things that are like badly formatted, um, like this inside of just a regular bit of text, then I uh, can do it, as we've seen, using the GQ verb to reformat these paragraphs. Um, but one way we can do it is by going to the top, and then I'll do G, Q, close curly brace, which says jump to the end of this paragraph. And now to do the rest of the paragraphs, I can just keep hitting dot, keep mashing dot until it scans through the whole rest of the file. So when you get used to using Vim, being able to use the dot command to repeat what you've done previously is uh, a super helpful thing to be able to do. Now. We have not even really gotten to the end of all of the things that Vim can do. I uh, have more that I can talk about Vim with you, but I think that's probably a good point to end for now. I think this hopefully shows you things that Vim can do that other text editors just can't do. No other text editor that I know has the ability to chain up commands using sort of a grammar of sorts where we can say, not just delete this line, but also delete any sort of text object or any sort of motion that we have. That is really, I feel like, the killer feature of Vim. And like I said, it's not so much that it lets you be more efficient, 
but it's also that it lets you sort of treat the file in a more higher level view. I don't, when I'm writing code in Vim, I don't need to think of it as just a stream of characters, but rather I can reference things like this current method I'm in, or the inside of this while loop, or the inside of these parentheses. And for me, being able to work with the text at a higher level like that feels more powerful and more sort of fulfilling to use. Then we also talked about things like the mark system and the register system, being able to do different uh, ways of entering insert mode, and then also different, um, and then also being able to use the dot command to repeat things that you've done in the past. So that's all for this week. Uh, then next week of this class, we will be talking more about shell scripting. We'll go back and revisit shell scripts and learn how to do a little bit more complicated things in them, like do if statements and loops and even function calls. So I'll see you back next week for that. Thanks.